All right, everyone, we are on to the first sort of substantive lecture of the course in this first two weeks of remote asynchronous lectures. Uh, hopefully you have made it to your discussion sections and are getting some sort of live feedback from the TAs on any questions you might have. I've been fielding a lot of emails. Um, unfortunately, with a lot of them, I can't be of much help because they are about technical issues. So uh, Canvas support is your resource for most of that um when it comes to you know i know a i've been using canvas well i know a bit but so do you and most of you are probably as good at technical issues if not better than i am so if it's an issue that baffling you it's it's likely would baffle me too so um i would say first step for like it type stuff is the relevant technical support links right and then you know if you are still coming up short or they direct you to me, then I'm, I'm happy to give it a shot. But it's not my area of expertise is internet technology. Okay, so today we're going to talk about theoretical hypotheses. 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 Um, this is going to. This is chapter two. I'm splitting it into two lectures. It's a long chapter. Um, so in the text, they they use sort of like the initial big framing example as the discovery of the structure of DNA as being a double helix. Um, so the background to this is uh, Watson and Crick. You may know those names, right? They're the famous names associated with the discovery of the helical structure of DNA. Um, Watson was an American. He arrives at Cambridge in England to work on his PhD. He's uh, in the 1951. He's working on trying to figure out the physical structure of DNA. So why is he interested in DNA? Well, we've known for a long time since Gregor Mendel, at least, right, the, a monk who discovered some of the genetic, some of the, the ways that plants sort of inherit their characteristics from their parents. Um, children resemble their parents, right? These traits in humans are transmitted through the sperm and the eggs. Um, and whatever that is, sort of as a placeholder for whatever that is, that mechanism, right, that transmits these properties that are similar between parents and children, we call genes, right? So the question is, what is a gene? Sort of we know in the abstract by deduction that there must be something like this, right? And you can sort of breed different plants with each other and see how the various traits um, get transmitted in certain circumstances and not others. And you can make some pretty um, accurate inferences about sort of the functional properties of, of whatever is doing this stuff. So we call those genes, but we like to know precisely what they are. So we knew a little bit at that time about sperm and eggs. We knew they contained DNA. We also knew they contained proteins. Um, at the time, most of the scientists thought that the genes were associated with the proteins, right? But Watson, who had sort of learned this through another scientist named Luria, was sort of also aware of some, became aware of some research by another scientist called Avery that suggested that maybe the gene DNA was more responsible, right, for the transmission of these characteristics, and so he wanted to pursue that angle, sort of going against it. Um, at the time, scientists, they knew a bit about the parts that made up DNA, but what they didn't really know was the way they were arranged in the molecule, right? So uh, we knew it was a, a chain of nucleotides, right? So in each one of those consists of a sugar molecule, a phosphate molecule, and a base, right? So you can see in, in the, the picture there, you've got a chain, right, of basically these, these little sets of three, right? Um, we also knew that there's two types of bases and each of which had its own subtype, right? So you've got purines, which are adenine and guanine, I'm probably mispronouncing some of these, and the pyrimidines, which are cytosine and thymine. Um, so that we knew a lot, we knew a fair amount, right? But the question was at this time, how did all these parts fit together? And Watson thought if they could figure this out, then that would teach us a lot about the role of DNA in inheritance. So here are the right the two types of bases, each with their So meanwhile, uh, another scientist, Wilkins, over in London, had been taking X-ray photographs of DNA. All right, so here we have a, an x-ray photograph, it's a bit confusing. Um, 
But if you're trained, right, to look at these photographs, they these tell you that whatever it's a photograph of has a regular crystalline structure. You can see some of the regularity, right, in the sort of lines and the repetition. Um, so this revealed some hints, right, as to the structure, right? All this, all the knowledge they had so far about the parts of the DNA were from biochemistry, observing different reactions. Um, but they, this is the first time they sort of were able to get a, a actual look at it in a sense and what it looks like. What does the structure look like? Watson had also, you know, discovered that some protein molecules were helical in structure, right? And we'll see lots of pictures of that, but it's sort of a twisted two strand, some number of strands, right, that are sort of twisted together like a spiral staircase, right? Um, so some people had discovered this about protein molecules by building models which were based on the X-ray photographs, right? So all of this could be, DNA might be right, analogous to proteins in this. Meanwhile, back at Cambridge, Watson meets um, his future partner, Crick, who also believes that DNA is important for inheritance. So again, he's on the same sort of idea of bucking the, the, the dominant trend and, and thinking about this. So they start working together and their speculation is like, well, since these proteins have a helical structure, maybe DNA has a helical structure too. Um, Crick develops a theory about what x-rays should look like when they take a picture of helical molecules and my head is blocking some of it but you can see it below there um, so they get an idea right the, of what a picture of dna ought to look like if it were in fact a helix and given this theory they start to narrow down what sort of structure dna might have right um, they figure it's got to be somewhere between two and four polynucleotide chains um, so they start working on a three chain model right, right in the middle. So how are the molecules arranged into a helix? So here is a um, on the right a picture of a helix. This is a two chain, right? But one question they had, they were still they were working on a three chain model. But one question you want to ask either way, whether it's two or three chains, is um, where are the bases, right? You there's options. Um, they could be on the inside of like the twisted helix, or they could be on the outside. And it's here that you have a picture of a base flipped out, right? Um, well, at the beginning, it seemed like much more complicated to try to jam all the bases on the inside. So they started with a model with the bases on the outside, right? Um, but they quickly found a flaw in that model, right? So um, DNA is surrounded with water, right? And um, they had calculated, other scientists had calculated how much water DNA actually contains and it turns out that the model they had just didn't leave enough room for that much water there's no way all those h molecules could fit in their model <clears throat> so um they took a little break right they kind of got stumped for a minute um he was working on photographing to tobacco molecules which also have a helical structure um that's a found a tobacco molecule that's what it is it, doesn't exactly look helical to me, but I guess if you zoom in on, I, I guess I can see it looks as helices in there. Um, so, and meanwhile, there was some more data coming in, right? More people were becoming interested in DNA, right? So all of a sudden this sort of like, they're no longer totally bucking the trend, right? And it's starting to get trendy. Um, another scientist, Chargaff, discovers that the relative amounts of some of the bases in DNA are the same across many species, right? Um, so if you've got a certain amount of one base, you're guaranteed right, a, a corresponding certain amount of another base, right? Um, I didn't quite know what that meant, right? But it did seem significant, right? Interesting data. Um, so now they're getting a little competitive. A lot of other people are sort of on to this DNA idea. So the three chain model, didn't, was not consistent with the data as far as like the amount of water. So they decided to try a two chain model and to put the bases inside. Now the problem with putting the bases on the inside, right, is the helix is has the same diameter throughout, right? But the bases are of different sizes, right? So how can they sort of all match up? Um, they do need to connect in the middle. Um, so they tried to build it anyway, and they and they first start trying matching like bases with like, so adenine with adenine and so on. 
Um, it turns out that some other scientists figure out that the bases can't bond like that. They can't bond to, they can't bond the same in that way. But they were building an actual model like out of cardboard and, and I think some metal and stuff, right? Um, and Watson noted that like, well, adenine and thymine, if you put them together, actually turn out to be the exact same size as guanine and cytosine if you put them together, right? So if you always join, right, those two types of bases together, you're gonna get a uniform diameter all the way up. Um, so now they've got their model, right? And they've actually got a physical model they built. Um, and they confirm, right, by X-ray photography that in fact, it looks like what they predicted it would look like, right? They win, they discovered the structure of DNA, right? Or, or so they concluded, right? So that's the story, right? And that's just sort of a, a narrative of a scientific episode in history, right? Um, and as presented, I didn't present it quite as completely as the as the text, which is in turn summarizing it from sort of a biography or of this historical episode. Um, there's a lot of details in there, right? Um, the whole story, if you tell it, it's gonna be a mix of some rational, logical inquiry, some stuff about people's idiosyncratic personalities, right? A little bit of competition, uh, a bit of luck, inspiration. Um, so the trick is to pull out the elements of the story. They're gonna be common to other scientific discoveries and encapsulate what are the rational elements of this process, right? If we wanna give a schematic of like, what's the logic of discovering something important in science um, does it look like, right? If we we take out the details of personality and stuff. Um, now, the truth is you can't always leave out the personalities, right? Um, context, science is something done by humans. It's always gonna be in a human context, right? Um, these scientists are humans. They are not always completely guided by right, a pure pursuit of truth and always guided by logic. They can be competitive, egotistical, backstabbing, and so on, right? But so maybe that's a good thing, all right? That means that the discoveries of science aren't dependent on any particular human just being really outstanding, right, in some way. Um, hopefully the idea is that uh, despite all these different personalities, there's something about the structure of scientific inquiry that uh, helps it to work so well and to create these many incredible advances that we, I don't think I have to sell you on science, right? We can land people on the moon, we can cure many diseases um, that used to cripple, cripple populations, right? Uh, so like the Black Plague, things like that, right? So science is great, there's something great about it. And it's probably a good thing that the great thing isn't just that there's a few great humans that do good stuff, right? There's something about the logic of it. Okay, so, We've granted science is a human activity with all the messiness that that entails, right? Um, so what distinguishes it from all the other human activities, right? Cooking, art, politics, religion, right? Um, well, one way to characterize what scientists do is that they explore how the world works, right? Um, religion is mainly exploring um, our relationship with God or with right, supreme beings or with um, the universe in some spiritual sense, right? Politics is investigating the way that societies work. Um, science is investigating the world, right? In, I guess, the most general sense, right? Um, so the one thing that all the people in that story had in common was that they're trying to figure out the structure of DNA, right? And that's part of a larger project of trying to figure out how genes work, right? What is the mechanism that makes it so that um, if my hair is blonde, my daughter's hair is more likely to be blonde. Um, how, do, how does that happen? Um, so the thing about science that distinguishes it from, for example, much philosophy, is scientists aren't doing this purely by reason, right? They're not just using logic, just not thinking about how could it work, which ways lead into contradictions. They do a little bit of that, right? But the distinctive thing about science that makes it science is they, carefully and deliberately interact with the world, right? In ways that help validate um, their hypothesis about the world. The world itself is telling you which of the possible ways it might work is correct. 
we can break this process down into several parts. Um, one part, finding a problem, right? So nobody, you don't get a degree in how the world works in general, right? Every scientist is going to be focusing on a very particular problem. And it, it, if any of you are in the sciences or <clears throat> even in any discipline, really, you know that if you're getting like a PhD, you're focusing on something very, very narrow, right? Some very specific aspect of either literature or art or whatever, or in the sciences, some particular aspect of the world, right? So for Watson, this was the structure of DNA, right? Not even necessarily the, right, the chemical aspects of DNA. He was focused on kind of literally the shape of DNA, right? So how a scientist comes to focus, how do you find a problem? Well, again, any of you are, have been in a PhD program or tried to come up with some sort of research uh, project, um, it's a little bit of, your own likes and dislikes, your own life story, a little bit of accident inspiration. So how they find the problem is not really the focus of the people, but people do it, right? So once they found a problem that they wanna focus on, some aspect of the world, a question that's unanswered, um, the next thing we do is construct models, right? So um, the Watson story was chosen in part, right? This is DNA story because they were literally building models. It couldn't be more clear, right? The model of of the thing they were trying to study. Um, in this text, that is gonna be the the, frame, the way we frame um, scientific inquiry is in terms of models, right? We'll talk about theories a bit too. That's sort of a competing way to talk about this. The authors of this text have sort of like uh, chosen a particular kind of viewpoint from philosophy of science, right? So. If you were a philosopher and you're very interested in philosophy of science, you might be a little dissatisfied with this course because they're just sort of making some blank claims or saying this is the way we're looking at it, right? Um, but I think it's a good way to look at it, right? Um, we're going to go with them and we're going to be talking about models, right? This is how we uh, are, are scientific. <clears throat> now, they're not all going to be built out of cardboard like the DNA one. Some of them will be much more abstract mathematical models, um, but nonetheless. This is all going to be framed in terms of models. Well, once you've got a model, you have to decide if it's a good model, right? Does it actually fit the world? Um, you can't just build a really elegant model, right? That seems to be internally coherent, right? And just admire it and assume that it's true of the world. Uh, you do actually have to, again, perform, do some sort of interaction in the world that, that tests and, and, and we call this sort of interaction with the world an experiment. Um, we will be talking much more about experiments and, and how those can support or uh, refute model. Um, once you're convinced that you're personally convinced that your model fits, right, by doing an experiment and getting the result um, that supports it, <clears throat> you need to, you're not done, right? You now need to convince other people right, to believe in your model. Um, this will involve talking to other scientists in your department or around the world, presenting at conferences, publishing in scientific journals, and so on. Um, and then finally, for scientific discoveries to filter down to us, the non-specialists, um, you need teachers, journalists, right? People printing in popular publications, talking on TV, teaching courses. Um, now, ideally, when it gets down to this level, they should present it in a way that allows us to reconstruct the process of discovery in enough detail that we can evaluate the model, right? Because again, in this course, we're not asking you necessarily to go read journal articles, right? Every time you have a question about science, um, the goal is hopefully to just be able to take reports in popular publications and in a rough and ready way, sort of pick out the relevant parts and see whether claims are supported, right? And then how and why, when you should apply this to your life. So different types of models, right? Um, <clears throat> uh, Watson and Crick built what we'd call a scale model, like as a physical model, right? Uh, scale was about a billion to one. So their model was about a billion times bigger than the thing they were modeling, right? The, uh, DNA helix, extreme right difference of scale, 
um, more typical models that you might be used to seeing or like maybe in engineering tests, if you've ever seen sort of like in little wind tunnels, they'll have a, a sort of a, a model of a car, right? That like, and they check how, how the wind flows over the shape of a car. Those will be, you know, be smaller, but maybe a tenth of the size or hundredth of the size or a billionth of the size. Um, and then you've also got much more abstract models. So building scale models is, is I don't think, the frequent thing you'll see in scientific discovery. Um, so other types of models. Um, one way you might characterize a model is, is being an analog model, right? And in a sense, all models are analogs. Um, so you might recall, I think I didn't uh, repeat this in my in my summary of it, but it's in the text, right? When Watson comes up with the idea that DNA might be structured helically, um, he cites a, a spiral staircase. He saw a spir spiral staircase that sort of inspired the idea, as well as looking at the helical structure of certain proteins, right? So this is what we call an analog model in that um, he's thinking about something that's not DNA, a staircase, but thinking that, oh, maybe DNA is analogous to the staircase in certain respects, right? In its shape. Um, there's lots of analog models, probably the most famous one, the one that you've most encountered, at least in maybe elementary school and junior high, is the, the analog, is the solar system model of the atom, right? We're in the most simplistic version of the parts of an atom, which I have sort of pictured over the right. You've got a nucleus in the middle that looks very much like the sun, and you've got these electrons orbiting around, right? Much like the planet's orbit. Sun. Um, it was a very useful model in the beginning, right? Once you set up that model, then certain questions uh, suggest themselves, right? How, how do the electrons stay in their orbits? What forces are at play, um, right? Do they ever change orbits under what conditions, so on. Um, and so a, a model, even if it's not in the end perfectly accurate, can be a very fruitful model for generating questions and for helping us answer uh, questions we have. Um, but eventually, right, it, it turns out uh, quantum mechanics and such, we know that, you know, electrons aren't really any, in any determinate position at, at any one time. And, and it sort of depends on when they're observed, right, what, whether they'll collapse into a particular state. So in the end, a good model will probably um, engender its own demise, right? If it's fruitful and it's causing us to make progress, eventually we'll discover the ways in which the, the model is sort of less than adequate. In the text, they talk about maps a bit, right? Um, to help us understand theoretical models, right? So theoretical models are probably the most common models in science, um, right? They're sort of presented in words or even equations, right? They're not um, physical scale models or even like, oh, think about a staircase, right? But they're a bit more abstract. Um, one way to understand a theoretical model is to <clears throat> consider a map, right? So you look at this map, right? And they ask you a question, what's, what's the arrow pointing at? And you might say a building, right? Um, and they want to just to slow things down, right? And clarify a bit. They say, well, of course, strictly speaking, this arrow is pointing at a rectangle, right? On the screen. Um, that rectangle represents a building, right? So the key thing they want to, drill in, which is sort of obvious, but it bears repeating. Um, map is not the same thing as the thing it represents. Um, again, obvious, right? Also obvious that the cardboard right, model was is not DNA itself, right? Um, so the question is, what is this relation of representing something else? Um, how does a map represent something else? Well, uh, part of the answer there is gonna be that there's, there's similarity, right? There's a similarity of structure between the map and the area that it represents, right? So <clears throat> if uh, a, one rectangle is represented as being on top of another rectangle, right? That's gonna be, that's, if this is this representational relationship is accurate, that will mean that a building is north of another building, right? Um, if this river looks to be wider than an entire building on the map, then it ought to be wider than an entire building um, in real life, right? So certain structural relationships will hold 
even though one is right printed on a screen and another is uh, river buildings. But that's not just enough, right? Um, there's all kinds of similarity relationships, right? There's certain conventions have to be in play. Right? So it may by accident be the case that the relationship between my eyes and nose is similar to the relationships in buildings in the world, right? But my face is not a map of those buildings um, simply because it's not, we don't have a convention, right, of using people maps for buildings. Um, so this is something you learn as you grow up, right? We know all about maps and the way they're supposed to be used and the things supposed to be represented in things that aren't, right? So the thickness of the map is going to be very thin. That's not going to mean that is as thin as a piece of paper. We know which parts to ignore and which parts to pay attention to. Um, so even for Watson and Crick's model, right, you need to know a fair bit about chemistry, right, to interpret it correctly and to know which relations in the model are going to be relevant and which ones you can ignore. Um, so often when it gets into sort of the special, these sciences, right, these specialized areas, lay people like us are not going to be aware of all the relevant conventions. Um, and the last thing to say about the relationship between maps and models is that by necessity, maps are going to be less than perfectly accurate, right? They're going to leave some stuff out, right? If it was a perfect representation, then it would just be the thing, right? Um, so, and it's only going to represent certain relevant properties. So I'm sure there are trees, right, in this area that are not represented on the map. Um, I'm sure that if you zoomed in on the exact angles of these rectangles, they would not be exactly the same as the uh, angles of the buildings, right? But um, nonetheless, uh, it can be good enough for certain purposes. So how does this help us understand a theoretical model? Well, a theoretical model is going to be even more abstract than a map, right? Um, we could describe it as a part of an imagined world, right? <clears throat> so Watson chose to manifest this imagined model, right? This way the world could be um, in cardboard. We didn't have to, right? He could have used sentences like the model has three sugar phosphate backbones that twist into a helical structure. So there's different ways of representing these things. You can use a map, you can use a model, you can use words, you can use um, equations. Um, now, of course, that particular description would have been a false one, right? Because it says there's three chains and DNA, in fact, has two chains. But it's a possible molecule that could exist, right? Again, it's a imagined world, so it still counts as a model, right? even if it doesn't match the world. Um, so the scale model that they built bears a similarity to the theoretical model, right? The theoretical model, which you might describe purely in words. Um, of course, you again, you have to, in order to make that connection or to understand the similarity, you have to understand certain conventions, right? So if red wires in the model are standing for hydrogen bonds, right, then um, the model will be similarity, but you have to understand that that's what those represent. Um, you don't, theoretical models don't just happen in science, right? We can build them anywhere, right? So if you are planning a wedding, right, you might build a theoretical model of the event in, that's going to happen in the future, right? You're thinking about all the people that are going to sit at the various tables and who's going to sit where and where is the band going to be, so on. Um, I mean, maybe some of you have been planning your wedding uh, since you were young, right? And uh, it hasn't existed yet, and you're not even entirely sure that it ever will exist, right? Um, maybe things will happen, maybe you'll end up having to elope. But, um, that doesn't matter, right? The part doesn't need to exist. It's just a model. Well, the model is essentially an imagined world, an imagined version of the world, right? Um, here we have Newton's laws. So here's a, this is a model as well, right? It's just several laws written out um, in words. One includes, uh, there's one equation in there, F equals MA. That's a theoretical model. All right, so <clears throat> what do we do with these models, right? How do, those, how do these give us knowledge about the world? Well, for any theoretical model, we can ask whether it fits the world, right? Um, and to claim that a theoretical model fits the world is to claim that a theoretical hypothesis is true. Um, 
So what's a theoretical hypothesis? A theoretical hypothesis is a statement about a relationship between a theoretical model and some aspect of the world, right? So it claims that some specific part of the model is similar to some specific part of the world in some respect. If the similarity holds, the hypothesis is true. If not, it's false. So the hypothesis that DNA has three chains is false. The hypothesis that DNA has two chains is true. Now, that's not the only part of the model, right? Um, it's helical, right? So there's not only chains, but they're in a certain right structure. They're, they're twisted. Um, that wasn't mentioned in the hypothesis, right? So the hypothesis is just mentioning some part of the model. So, you know, what does it mean to say that, right, that the hypothesis is true and that the model is similar to the world? These these notions of similarity, truth, they're um, a whole other philosophy class, right? We we don't have time to get into that. So. I am going to assume that you have some pre-theoretical notion of what it means for a sentence to be true and what it means for something to be similar to something else. And we're just going to go with that because if we get into any more detail, um, it, it, it's going to be too long. All right, so theories. So we've been talking a lot about models, and I'm sure you've heard about scientific theories as well, right? <clears throat> um, Certainly, right, scientists produce theories. Um, the word theory in common parlance is a bit vague and ambiguous, right? Certainly you've probably heard, you may have heard someone who um, doesn't support evolution and maybe believes is a creationist say something like, well, it's just a theory, right? Or you might say something's a mere hypothesis. Um, but that, you, as you probably know, is uh, not the way we use the term theory in science, right? Um, a scientific theory can be well supported by the evidence and it's it's still a theory right but it's um, almost certainly true as well right um, so a, a scientific theory as, as we'll describe it is going to have two components uh, there'll be a family of models right so it doesn't have to be a single model there may be several models right you may have the model of dna um, you may have the model of the other proteins and how dna interacts with other proteins with messenger rna and so on right um, now this family of models, they might include some scale models, some theoretical models, um, right? And there's also in a theory gonna be a set, sorry, I'm putting it in a mug. There's also gonna be a set of theoretical hypotheses that pick things out in the world, right? And make a claim about the fit between that thing and the model, right? So in 1953, we only had sort of the double helix model, one thing in the world that applied to, now we have a, a rich sort of like set of models um, constitutes an entire theory of molecular biology, right? It includes models of RNA, other sorts of substances. So a scientific theory is sort of in, in the sense we're using it much broader than a single model. Okay, so we talk about this fit, right, between the model and the real world. Well, how do we know? Um, how do we know if a theoretical hypothesis is true and that, in fact, a model does, in some respect, fit the real world? Um, well, the real world contains lots of information, right? Not all of it is going to be relevant to a model that we want to know about. Let's call the information that is relevant uh, data, right? In singular, that's going to be a datum, right? But world data. Um, so data is going to have some special characteristics, right? Not just anything counts as data. Um, First, data needs to be obtained through a physical interaction with the world. Um, now that interaction may be active, right? So maybe you dissolve the substance in water, right? To see how it behaves. It could be passive. Maybe you're just measuring radio signals from space, right? But either way, that is an interaction with the world. Um, number two, the relevant differences in the data need to be reliably detected, right? So detection, what does that look like? You know, maybe it's observing the color of a litmus paper to see if it turns pink, right? Um, determine the acidity of a, of a, of a substance. Uh, it might require very specialized instruments and their outputs are going to be like tables of numbers in an Excel sheet or a graph, right? Um, but there needs to be some, uh, some kind of detection that's more accurate than not, right? Um, 
in our DNA story, for example, right, one piece of data was Chargaff's discovery of the one-to-one -one ratio of purines to pyrimidines in DNA, right? We didn't get into the details of how he did discover that. I don't frankly know them, right? Um, Franklin's discovery of the amount of water in DNA, Franklin's X-ray photographs of DNA. Um, so these are all were obtained by interactions with the world, right? Um, we took a photograph, an X-ray photograph of an actual sort of like DNA molecule. Um, now the helical structure of the proteins, right? That was important to the whole process. It doesn't count as data, right? At least not relevant data to the DNA model because it wasn't an interaction with DNA, right? It was an interaction with another protein that had a helical structure that inspired the thought that maybe DNA had a similar structure, but doesn't count as data for this particular model. All right, experimental data and predictions. So sometimes we have data before we have a theory, right? And sometimes we do construct a theory based on that data. I mean, almost always, really, right? You don't just pull theories out of thin air, right? You sort of like learn something through your undergraduate and graduate um, uh, <clears throat> learning, right? Uh, that you have a certain base of knowledge, you're aware of certain data, and then when you start dreaming up your own original theory, right? It, it's, you tend to construct it to fit that data that you already know. Um, but for our purposes, that stuff is not going to count as experimental support for a theory, right? When you construct a theory to fit existing data, um, that's not going to count, right? So even though we do sometimes, and again, we're getting into controversial philosophy of science territory, but we're just going with the way this text sets it up, which I, is not a bad way to set it up. It's a reasonable way to set it up, right? Um, even if you may disagree on philosophical grounds. So sometimes when we talk about a theory that's been designed to make sure that it fits pre-existing data, we talk about that as the theory predicting the data, you know, even though it's not strictly earlier in time, but we're going to stick with, um, we're going to privilege experimental data that comes from new predictions of the theory. Right? Um, and computer simulations, not going to count as data for us, right? Again, no interaction with the real world. So. The text is making some, I don't know, maybe controversial stands here, but I, I, I think they're reasonable ones. Okay, we are at the attendance quiz. Sorry, there's no easy way to copy and paste this, so I'll try to give you enough time to type this all out in another window. Of course, you can always pause it as well. Okay, hopefully that is enough time. Again, if not, just pause it and we'll move on. Okay, the components of a scientific episode, right? So we're going to be analyzing scientific episodes in this course. We're going to get a bunch of them, right? Little stories, not a little less detail than the DNA one, but, you know, in some detail. Um, we're going to be analyzing them and figuring out uh, what does this mean about where's the theoretical model does this episode show that the model is supported or not right so the model's gonna have four parts right this is our own model right so now we have a model of scientific episodes in general and each of the scientific episodes will contain its own model right so this is our general model of scientific inquiry and this model has four parts there's some real world object or process that's under investigation there's a model of that real world object or process. The model is going to entail some predictions, right? And there'll be some experimental setup, right, that you need in order to interact with the world. Um, and the predictions are to, to describe, given, right, the model and the experimental setup that you'll use, what this data is going to look like if the model is correct, if it does fit the real world. Um, and then finally, you need the actual data. You do the experiment, right? You get a reading, you get a color on the litmus paper, you get an x-ray photograph, right, of the, of the molecule, and you decide whether it agrees with the prediction of the model or it does not agree. Well, this, is our, uh, this is from the text, right? This is our four components. And again, my head is on top of some of it. 
on top of the prediction part, but you've got the real world and it's got a certain relationship with the model, right? They're not the same. Um, you've got the model and down below the model where my head is, is predictions, right? Um, the predictions will either agree or disagree with the data. And then the real world, right, is what is providing us the data through our interaction with it. So I'm just going to repeat basically what I did. Uh, the real world and the model, they're connected by the theoretical hypotheses, right, which assert that the model fits the real world. Um, the fit's only going to be, you know, in certain respects to some degree of accuracy, right? There's going to be all kinds of caveats. But um, if the model does not fit in those respects, we've got a false hypothesis, right? Um, the model and the prediction, they're connected by a process of reasoning or calculation. So they're in light of the experimental design, right? But this is a writing predictions from a model is sort of a process of logic, right? You see a, a general claim and you say, okay, well, if DNA is the shape it is, then we should predict that an X-ray photograph will look like this, right? <clears throat> the real world and the data, those are gonna be connected by a physical interaction, right? You actually take the X-ray photograph of the DNA molecule. And then the relationship between the data and the prediction is going to be either one of agreement or disagreement. Um, if the data agrees with the prediction, this is support for the model. Disagreement indicates a lack of similarity between the model and the real world, which indicates that the model is wrong, at least in some respect. So note that this top relationship, the real world model relationship, is a relationship you can't directly observe, right? Um, directly look at DNA and see if it looks like the model. Um, the bottom part can be observed, right? Uh, we can see if the data agree with the prediction, right? We can have the picture um, of what the X-ray photograph is supposed to look like. We can have the actual X-ray photograph. We can see if it's similar. Um, notice the left side of the graph is all things in the real world, right? Um, the right side of the graph is all these symbolic relations between model predictions, right? This possible object, right? This imagined world and the predictions of what would follow if that world were real. But nothing on the right side of the of the figure might necessarily exist. All right, we are on the last slide. We're doing all right on time, a little early. Um, so last few things, we're, we're gonna see that there's more to evaluate and model than just these four parts determining whether the data fit the prediction. Um, these are central components. This is where we have to start. Um, now you might notice if you are involved in any uh, sciences in any detail that there's a lot that goes by the name of science and gets published and things like that that doesn't necessarily include all these parts. I've read plenty of scientific publications based on computer simulations that claim to right, uh, support models about uh, psychology. Um, I mean, again, this is a, uh, you know, this is a philosophical stance that the text is taking, but I, I think it's fair to say that if one of those four parts is missing, um, you might be in a situation where it's just impossible to determine where the model is actually any good. And I think it is safe to say we should privilege um, interactions with the world, right, as the best support for them. All right, so <clears throat> that is it for the lecture. Um, do let us know if you have any problems. Do show up to discussion, right? I think that's your best place to get real time feedback. Um, you'll have, you know, make sure you've uh, completed the attendance links for Monday and Wednesday, those quizzes, and uh, uh, you will have some uh, exercises due. Look at the syllabus. I don't, it's not in front of me, so I don't remember exactly the date. But those are the, the next sort of upcoming items. And, um, yeah, one more week online and then hopefully we will be back in person, but uh, that's it for now.